All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Tonight is part four of Toy of the Gods. I'm glad to read this to you in case you, you know, don't want to buy the Kindle or anything like that. You can just listen in and relax and enjoy your evening in. Oh, yes, this is my Death Star mug, which I totally love. Got it at Comic Con this year. All right, so. I'm going to get comfy here. Make sure you guys can hear what I'm up to. All right, so next chapter for tonight is Trouble in Paradise. John whipped around. She had never expected to see the stalwart captain at a loss for words. She found the gray suit and blue tie to be very fetching on him, but left her feeling a bit underdressed with just a towel. He lifted the dresses in his hands, still at a loss for words. Then finally he said, I brought these. I wasn't sure which one to leave. He dropped them both on the chair and headed for the door. What were the, gunsh <laughs> what were the gunshots about, she asked. He paused with his hand on the doorknob. Someone shot one of David's dogs. It looks like they found intruders near the river. One of the dogs came back with a piece of someone's clothing. Oh no. Leslie walked toward him. That's terrible. He turned to look at her. David's a bit devastated at losing Jag. He raised all his dogs from pups. John looked down at her bare feet and then inspected her towel. She found her temperature warming up despite her wanting to dislike the captain, but figured she could use her time wisely. Captain, why am I here? Why did you want me on this trip? Please call me John. He put on his warm smile and shrugged. I asked Jessup to find a writer for the trip and he found you. Leslie shook her head and took a step closer. Jessup mentioned that you wanted me by name. Why? Oh, well, he cleared his throat. I had heard about how, well, you were, are an adventure writer and you seem like the perfect fit. He was trying to be careful about what he said. She could tell. So you know I haven't worked for a year. Yes, Jessup told me though that you have no problem selling the upcoming stories to some magazines. Leslie smiled at that. True, my reputation in writing doesn't seem to be tarnished, just rusty. His eyebrows knitted close to, closer together. Tarnished? Why would you think it would be tarnished? I just, now it was her turn to be slightly flustered. I feel very guilty about what happened in Iceland, and I feel that it might have tarnished my reputation a bit. I think you see yourself much differently than the rest of the world. Leslie could feel herself flushing this time, and she pointed at the dresses. Thank you for the choice of wardrobe. He opened the door and said quickly, thank you. Thank the hotel. They're the ones that screwed up the evening. And then he stalked out, closing the door soundly behind him. Well, Leslie said under her breath, fine then. Changed and ready for dinner again, Leslie stopped in the lobby to see if there were working phones. Certainly, replied the clerk at the front desk. While we have our generators working, all the phones are available. You can use any of the house phones to call out. Now the phone was ringing on the other end. Simon here. Simon, it's Leslie. She felt a sense of relief at hearing his familiar voice. I hope this isn't an inconvenient time. Not at all. It's good to hear from you. Where are you? I'm at the Inca Resort. We'll be heading out in the morning, I think. It sounds exciting. I wish I could go with you. I wish you could too. But I wanted to find out something. Before I continue on the ship, I had heard that someone who was going to take the ship died, and I was wondering if you had heard anything. You must be in the tourist, Victor Newsland. Yes, you know about that? This is a small area. News of this kind travels quickly here, and I get reports from the police of unusual instances. It appeared that he was exploring on his own without a guide and found his way to a cliffside. The cliffs in that area have been known to have mudslides. He was there at the wrong time. Hearing it from Simon made it all feel less threatening. The man had died in an accident. The captain was just overly cautious. 
She was already writing the story in her head, Mysterious Death and Troublesome Captain. Thank you, Simon. I appreciate the information. Just please be careful yourself, Leslie. I expect to see you in a week for dinner. You bet. Talk to you soon. Leslie spied AJ, her unmistakable cropped hair sticking out in the back. She was sitting at another house phone, leaning over and whispering. Leslie continued walking by the restaurant, then noticed John at a table with men, all in business suits. One of the men was facing away from her. From the color of his hair and the wave-like form of gray, he looked like the man she had seen with Simon yesterday, the one who had stormed out of the restaurant. She wanted to see the man closer, though. What would it hurt to introduce herself? She walked in the restaurant, feeling just a bit conspicuous. The silky blue dress clung to her body, down to her hips, and then flared out and down to the floor. Her long brown hair was still a little damp, so it was falling around her face in soft curls. Her shoes were just a pair of slippers that someone had dropped off, so her footfalls were quiet. She was close to the table when she heard the man say to John, We're impressed with its speed, having arrived so quickly from Nauta. We're looking forward to our trip. John opened his mouth to reply, but stopped when he noticed her approached. He stood to greet her. Leslie. Hello, John. She mimicked his warm tone. He looked over her dress as he, inspe as he had inspected her towel, but his brow was wrinkled. Are you gentlemen joining us on the Toy of the Gods? Now that she was close up, she could tell this was definitely the man she had seen with Simon. The, man, the men opened their mouths to reply, but John stepped in. No, they're not joining us. Then back to his table. We'll be right back. The man in the graying hair stood and bowed slightly to her as John gently steered her away from the table. Have a good evening, she waved on her way out the side doors that led to the open air and an outdoor patio with only a few couples and people out at this late dinner hour. John quietly closed the door behind them, his hand still gently on her arm. Leslie, I'm sorry, I'm trying to conduct a meeting. You know, Simon was meeting with that same man with the gray hair yesterday, except he was mad with Simon and stormed out. John's brows knitted together as he glanced into the restaurant and then back at Leslie. Why are you telling me this? Because something seems to be going on and I'm trying to figure it out and you are obviously the key. John put on his charming smile again. Nothing's going on. I'm just trying to find some future investors. She opened her mouth and her stomach chose that moment to let a loud gargle. Gurgle, <laughs> a gurgle. Sorry, I haven't eat much, eaten much today. The hotel is setting out some new food for everyone at the building. He pointed at the light of the building. Perfect time to take care of that hunger. He paused for a moment, then finally let go of her arm. The heat from his hand lingered. Before you go, oh, before you go, I know that you also specifically asked for Frederick to be on this trip. Why is that? Why two writers? How did you know that? She shrugged. Jessup mentioned it the other day. Yes, well, Frederick has some connections that you don't have. That seemed to be enough for him. He turned and headed back in. He paused before closing the door. You look great in that dress, by the way. Thanks, she responded. She thought of heading for the building, but here on the outdoor patio was a small bar. She didn't feel like approaching the scene of the former monkey frenzy. Instead, she saddled up to the front of the bar and ordered a drink, pulling the bowl of snack foods closer. She'd have one or two drinks before going back. It wasn't like she had to drive anywhere. Besides, what kind of trouble could she possibly get into all the way out here? She had drunk too much. She could feel her equilibrium was gone. Things were spinning slightly. She had carefully made her way to the lighted building walking like she was on eggshells, but mostly to keep her feet from going off in the wrong direction. She had safely made it to the building and sat at a table. Now she leaned over to the man next to her. Was that a man? She wondered through her blurry gaze. It looked like one. Hello, Leslie. The voice sounded familiar. The face was starting to come into focus. 
She laughed out loud. She was definitely drunk. There was no way Devin would be found alive or dead in the middle of the Amazon. She had been thinking of him and here he was in her drunken buzz. She leaned closer to the man to try to see if she could discern who he was, but he still looked the same. You're a little drunk, aren't you? He asked and kissed her forehead. It even smelled like Devin, the soft scent of cologne and manly soap. Yes, maybe, she answered, her words carefully formed, but she wasn't sure if she had actually said the words. Who are you? He smiled and moved in closer, his lips almost touching her ear. Devin, you remember your old boyfriend for a few years who loved you? She laughed and leaned back in her chair. No, I know it's not you. I was just thinking about you. He leaned toward her. You were thinking about me? When was this? Devin, she thought. It might have been Jessup's voice. She leaned, oh, yeah. She thought it might have been Jessup's voice. She leaned away from the hazy man and turned to look at Jessup. It was definitely Jessup. Jessup? Is this Devin? She pointed at the man seated next to her. <sighs> yes, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know it was him we were expecting. Her heart was beating faster and it helped her to get a little clear headed. Her vision cleared a little and she scooted back from Devin. Long ago boyfriend. She had made the right decision to end a not so perfect relationship. She could feel her cheeks burning and stood to go. I think I need some air. Are you sure you're up to walking around? Devin asked. She ignored the question and willed herself to walk straight. When she got to the stairs, she grabbed the handrail and slowly lowered herself down to each step. She stumbled on the last one and Devin was suddenly there to catch her. She pushed him away. Cut that out. He stepped back and disappeared up the stairs. I only know, I only want what's best for you, he said quietly, where no one could hear but her. She felt her cheeks burning even more and kept walking. Where to, she wasn't sure. All she wanted right now was a simple, calm, relaxing trip. A time to reflect. This thing was getting more complicated by the hour. What was Devin doing here? She started looking for a way out. The resort had to have a way out. She'd be happy to find a vehicle and drive herself out of here. Her things be damned. She'd leave them behind. She walked around to the front of the resort her eyesight growing blurry again. It was hard to see in the dark. There was a single light burning at the side of the building. She thought she could see a few vehicles parked out in the darkness. She slipped in some mud but kept going. She finally reached a Jeep and climbed in. She was searching for a push button start and found none. She moved to the next vehicle but her eyes were getting so heavy. She couldn't figure out where the starter might be. What are you doing in there? She closed one eye and used the other one to try and focus on the man who stood next to her. John? Yes, now what are you doing? She blew out the air and shook her head, almost falling over. I'm leaving, this is crazy. I don't think you're in any shape to be driving, he said. She immediately wanted to argue, but then realized he might be right. She scooted over and patted the steering wheel. You drive me then. Oh no, I have enough things to do without driving you around. He opened the door and reached for her hand. She slapped it back. Leslie, come on, I'll take you back to the ship. She wanted to argue, but she was so tired. She let him pull her out of the Jeep. When they started walking, she slipped again. He scooped her up and kept walking. Next chapter, the morning after. She opened her eyes with a groan. There was a massive net across her face. She grabbed at it and realized it was a mat over her hair flipped and flipped it to the side. She regretted that as the light from the small portal set her eyes hurting. A glance at the clock next to her bed said it was still early morning. She was in her bed, still wearing the blue dress from last night and was sad to see it splattered with mud, probably ruined, but she couldn't remember how that happened. She didn't even bother to check the mirror, but placed the dress on her chair and made her way to the tiny shower stall. She felt almost human after the hot water, change of clothes, and a couple of ibuprofen. 
She started up the stairs to the lounge, the smell of coffee, coffee tempting her to walk faster. The strands of laughter reached her and she stopped mid-step. She recognized the voice. That couldn't be right, she thought. It can't be him. Why would he be here? Then a tiny flash of memory from the night before. Leslie, are you okay? Samantha was coming up behind her, wearing skin-tight pink leather pants and a tank top. Sure, I was just thinking I forgot something. She grabbed the necklace Devin had given her. No time to take it off. It would feel strange letting him know that she still thought about him, but there was nothing for it. She continued up the stairs. The laughter up ahead had stopped. Someone was walking across the room and coming down the stairs. The silky southern twang greeted her. Leslie, I thought I heard your voice. I hope you recovered from last night. Devin reached out as if to hug her. She sidestepped the hug and held out her hand. Without missing a beat, he shook her hand. It gave Samantha a warm smile. And you are no doubt Miss Samantha Sorensen. Pleased to meet you. Funny. Leslie had expected a thrill from his touch, but there was nothing. Samantha gushed. You're Senator Yale. Leslie, you didn't... You didn't tell me you know Senator Yale. Devin, I'm just Devin today. Smooth as always, Leslie thought. Excuse me, Leslie said, grabbing a mug of coffee from the bar, joining Miguel and Frederick sitting at the table. Outside, the trees were moving by slowly. So slowly, Leslie didn't feel movement. Devin and Samantha joined them. Frederick was talking with Miguel. What's the area like? For today's hike, we'll be going up to a waterfall with a beautiful pool. Any locals around? Miguel shook his head. Probably not. The tribes that live out in the reserve stay farther out. They don't generally trust outsiders. We may see or meet someone we visit the ruins tomorrow, but not yet. Samantha was more interested in Devin. Devin, what's a senator doing here in Peru? Devin glanced at Leslie and said something about wanting to see the Amazon but realization struck home for her. I must be an idiot, she thought. He had to have had something to do with why she was here. She knew she wouldn't get any direct answer from Devin now. She could see it in his eyes that he had his politician's mask on, sincere and helpful, but not straight-laced. She downed the cup of coffee, set the empty mug down, and walked through and out, feeling Devin's eyes on her as she exited. Where would I find the captain? Probably on the bridge since the ship was in motion. She didn't hesitate this time at the authorized personnel only door. John was watching the river and the switches in front of him. I want off, she said. John turned to look at her and shook his head. We've been sailing all night. We're already 200 miles from the resort and that's the only place you could have gotten off. Then turn around, we can't be too far away, she insisted. We're talking about eight hours in the wrong direction. I honestly can't turn around now. It would devastate my future. John's voice was almost pleading. More of last night came back to her, the ill-fated attempt at escaping the Jeep. He must have left the second everyone was on board because he knew she wanted off. That's it, isn't it? She paced back and forth. He's the real reason I'm here. I could just slap someone. And I would deserve it, John responded. His sincerity stopped her pacing. At least when you're not putting on your charming smile that you were using on me yesterday. Why? I need help from the senator. He was reluctant to come unless you were here. That was the deal. Great, I'm a deal. And what exactly is Devin going to do for you? She fumed. Some of the materials I need are from Peru and this first voyage is significant. He's here to smooth the way as well as to expedite the materials for exporting. I'm sorry if him being here makes you uncomfortable. He insisted that you not know of him being on board until, well, it was too late. He turned and adjusted something, then turned back around. Did Jessup know? John shook his head. No, just another thing he's going to hate me for. Good, so I won't be the only one. Captain, I would appreciate it from now on if you were straight with me. John crossed his arms and leaned against the console. While we're talking straight, perhaps you can tell me how you know Simon. Surprised by the question, Leslie paused. 
we met at the hotel. Someone was in my room and might have stolen something. I needed help and he was there to help me. John's brow wrinkled at that. Was anything taken? No, she responded, just my feeling of security. Sun came up the ladder. John, we're getting close to the beachhead for our hike to the waterfalls, Sun said. John nodded and turned back to the console. If it's any consolation, Leslie, I'm sure the Senator has your best interest at heart. She knew that, and that more than anything annoyed her. She was somewhat flattered they had gone to this much trouble. At the same time, Devin had once again smoothed the way for her, helped her out of her stupor, which she hadn't been able to do it for herself. Damn him, she whispered under her breath. Leslie made her way back to the lounge for more coffee. Everyone had left, presumably to get ready for today's hike, where they'd get a chance to swim or soak in the hot spring. Miguel was the only one left, standing on the deck. She stepped outside. The sun and heat immediately made her feel heavy. He was looking out to the jungle. The toy was setting down on Sun's beachhead. It was a thin sandbar that reached out to the river. All anyone had to do was put down the plank and they could walk across to the edge of the jungle. Leslie thought that even the colors here seemed drenched in humidity. The green of the jungle was dark as well as the brown of the river and the deep blue of the sky against the clouds. A new sound began to emerge above the normal noise of the jungle. It sounded to Leslie like wind being sucked through a huge wind tunnel, loud and mournful. The sound was repeated from several different locations and continued to get louder. Miguel, she asked, what is that? Howler monkeys. They're putting out a warning that there are intruders. Monkeys? Leslie repeated and tried to see if she could spy them, but she, the edge of the jungle was too thick. I'm sure we'll see a few today. It is amazing and beautiful here, even if it is hot and humid. Ah, yes, it is indeed beautiful. I can't wait for you all to see the waterfall that we're hiking to today. It's not the tallest in the Amazon, but some things are just too difficult with tourists. She smiled at that and nodded. I know what you mean. I had some rich couple ask me to take them on a long distance hike in Alaska. I was sure I was going to regret it. It turns out we were only a, a few hours in when they decided roughing it wasn't for them. Some people just aren't cut out for really toughing it out. He replied, it's the tough kinds of trips that make me appreciate the things like a real bed or to sit down and relax without having, without having to pick a centipede off of my pants. Jessup came and joined them on the deck, ready to hike in his day, with his day pack in tow. Centipedes? We have centipedes somewhere? Not here at the moment, Miguel said, but you will need to be on the lookout for the bugs that will want to come home with you tonight. He nodded toward the jungle. What about people? Are we far enough to be away from everyone? Primarily, yes. Miguel pointed to the opposite side of the river. My brother and I once came across some dirt roads in that area. Barely passable, but well used. We don't know what whose road it is, but we stay away from anything that looks like it's in use. Why? Leslie asked. He sighed heavily. The problem is that some drug runners like to hide in the jungle, cut down what growth they can and grow drugs. They have been known to mine their fields and have men with guns guarding their territory. We'd rather explore the Amazon than become a permanent part of it. That seems to be a lot of work to go hide in some cocaine, responded Jessup. Hmm. The penalties here are tough for drug smuggling if they're caught, but those who grow their crops and get them sold will make quite a profit. Any indigenous tribes, Leslie asked. Miguel nodded. The way I like to describe it is there are different levels of tribes that live in the Amazon. There are the natives, like those who live in Nauta, they come to terms with living in a more modern world and even interact with it. Then there are the tribes that live out past the ruins. They will visit, they'll visit Nauta once in a while for supplies, but they're wary because drug dealers and illegal loggers have killed some of them, forcing them off of their lands. Then there are the tribes that live even farther out. They have no interest in knowing the outside world. They are far more dangerous, but we won't be going that far into the unknown territory. You call it unknown, but you know most of it. 
mentioned Jessup. Miguel responded, yes, but two men exploring doesn't make that area known. Besides, my brother and I can't keep doing this forever. We're getting older, and although our blood is from Peru, we're still a bit North American, and all the sickness and injuries we've had are taking their toll. Jessup nodded. I know what you mean. Ever hear from any of the tribes about the final whereabouts of Spafford? Leslie asked. Miguel nodded. The Mikpachu tribe members say they share shared information about a lost city with him. They're sure he disappeared on his way to find it from the pyramid ruins. Lost city, she asked. According to what Sun and I figured, there was a city not far from the pyramid. Unfortunately, the knowledge of the location of the city hasn't been passed on to the current tribe members, or more than likely for some reason they aren't willing to share the location anymore. Leslie felt the clank of the gangplank open. They watched it slowly lower and then sink into the sandbar. Sun walked out, accompanied by everyone who wasn't on the deck. He looked up, his neck craning to see them and waved them down. Come on, he said excitedly, let's go. They turned from the edge and grabbed their things. I don't know, said Jessup. I don't see he's slowed down any. Miguel sighed again. I don't know what's going on. He's been so different since our last trip. It's like he's a different man. Leslie dashed down the stairs, ready for an adventure. A different man? She needed to be a new, different woman. Maybe he could teach her how. And actually, I am going to stop there. Next chapter is the waterfall. And, yep, I think that's it for tonight. I hope everybody's had a good day. And... Sleep well, everyone.